Dr. Jan Pusse is an expert in political science, international relations, Middle East studies. With an Agia tandem project, he has published the book, Potpuls and Politics in the Middle East and North Africa. It is out now since a couple of weeks. It introduces multi-diverse perspectives on the upcoming World Cup in Qatar and showcases the rich history and the promising trajectories of football in the Arab region. We are honored to welcome with him our distinguished guests who will now be presented by Jan Pusse. I wish us all an insightful evening and I will now leave the floor to Jan Pusse. Dear Jan, the floor is yours. Mahmoud, um, thanks a lot for your kind introductory words and um, welcome to all of you to this panel discussion with the topic, the power of football in the Arab world and Germany. Um, in less than two weeks, actually, on 20th of November, the Football World Cup will start this year. Um, the World Cup is the biggest global sporting event um, and this edition will be special for several reasons. So in particular, it will be the very first World Cup that takes place in an Arab country. In terms of enthusiasm for football, it may come as a slight surprise that Qatar is hosting this mega event, because especially Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia and Morocco are the traditional powerhouses of football in the Arab world, both in terms of performance as well as the number of audiences in the stadiums. Moreover, in these countries, football also has a great history as local populations encountered the beautiful game already about 100 years ago after it was introduced by European colonial powers, in particular the British. Compared to this, Qatar was a little bit of a latecomer, with football arriving there only after the Second World War. In addition, this year's World Cup has generated considerably greater criticism than previous editions of the tournament, be it allegations of corruption around the awarding of the tournament to Qatar or human and labor rights standards in the country. But if we look back four years, the World Cup was hosted in Russia, so a similar um, debate could have taken place in this context. So I guess um, this tells us uh, more about FIFA maybe than about Qatar as such. But as a result, and this question will certainly come up in one way or the other also in the panel today, one could ask, to what extent the first ever World Cup in the Arab world represents both a chance and a challenge for the Arab world on the one hand and for Qatar on the other. In my view, the case of Qatar hosting the World Cup 2022 unquestionably shows that football and politics are clearly and always interconnected in multiple ways. Today's event will not be limited to the World Cup in Qatar, however. Rather, we would like to widen our focus both geographically and thematically to take a look at the Arab world as a whole and also at Germany and topics beyond the World Cup itself. Very generally, we can see that football can play a role both in terms of repression and emancipation, and this is the case both historically and presently. For instance, ruling elites have tried to use football in order to distract the population from domestic problems, but also in order to convey a particular image of their country to the world. And I'm giving you now a short example, which I have deliberately not taken from the Arab world. So um, this is a universal feature, which can be seen in the case of the example of the 2006 World Cup in Germany. Back then, under the slogan, a time to make friends, or in German, die Welt zu Gast bei Freunden, Germany tried to present itself as a hospitable, open-minded, and welcoming country. And 
As we learned in the aftermath of the World Cup 2006, allegations of corruption in relation to the awarding of the tournament seem to be a universal feature too. In order to learn more about these issues, we have a very interesting panel of experts here today. So before we get started with our discussion, I would like to introduce our panelists to you now. And I would like to start with Amro Ali. Um, all of you know him um, already probably as a co-president of Agia and as a lecturer in sociology at the American University in Cairo. And um, his research explores, as he states, the human condition under assault from forces of global consumption, material culture, and digital technology with a particular focus on how these forces shape identity, cities, modernity, and citizenship. And I'm very curious what this means to our discussion today. At Agia, he's currently co-running Salon Thefaki project, which brings Arab exiles into rich discussion on a variety of topics around the occasion of the Arab Spring's 10th anniversary. Amongst others, he is author of a chapter titled Mo Salah, a moral somebody, question mark, in a very interesting edited volume titled Global Middle East into the 21st Century by Asif Bayat and Linda Herrera, published in um, 2021 at um, University of California Press. Um, in addition, I would like to welcome and introduce to you Professor Mahfoud Amara. He is Associate Professor in Sports Studies and Sports Social Sciences and Management at the Physical Education Department at Qatar University in Doha. Dr. Amara has published substantively in different outlets on sports, business, culture, politics, and society in the Arab region. And I found particularly remarkable his book of 2012 titled Sport, Politics and Society in the Arab World, published with Perry Macmillan. And in addition, also the volume he edited titled The Olympic Movement and the Middle East and the North African Region, a history which also dates back um, about a century, you could say. He's also co-editor of a volume about sport in Islam and in Muslim communities, and also on sport in the African world. So I would say we can be very glad to have such an eminent expert here on our panel today. And I am equally grateful to welcome Hiba El Jafil here with us. She works as a sports coordinator at the National Evangelical Institute for Girls and Boys in Lebanon. Um, she holds the AFC, so the Asian, Asian Football Association's license, um, A license, and the um, B license from the German Football um, Association as a coach. And she is also founder and CEO of the NGO Unity for Change. After having led the Lebanese world, uh, the ne Lebanese women's football national team as a captain for 10 years, she also started a coaching career in the same team. And from 2014 to 2016, she coached the under 70s and under 19s and the seniors. Under her leadership, the team won the U17 Arab Cup in Doha 2015. Thus far, to my knowledge, the only international football title of Lebanese football. In addition to coaching, she has managed several football-related social projects. One of them is the Football for Adolescents project, encouraging the football education in public schools, sponsored by the Lebanese Ministry of Education, UNICEF, and the German Embassy of Beirut, amongst others. And as far as I know, she also did um, an internship at the German um, professional team of TSG Hoffenheim a couple of years ago. In addition, she also works as a consultant and trainer at many local and international NGOs. So welcome to you too, Hiba. Last but not least, it's also my pleasure to welcome here with you Özgür Özvatan. He is a political sociologist with a special focus on integration, extremism, and democracy research. And since September 2020, he is deputy head of department at the Berlin Institute for Empirical Integration and Migratory Research at Humboldt University. 
He studied interdisciplinary social sciences at the Humboldt University of Berlin, received his PhD from the Berlin Graduate School of Social Sciences, and is um, also he was visiting professor at the University of Toronto and visiting fellow at the University of Melbourne. His research interests include right-wing populism, extremism, as well as storytelling, deliberative theory, and collective learning in post-migrant societies. And in this vein, he has also studied how diverse national football teams can challenge established narratives of national belonging and thereby trigger debates over this national belonging across time and space. So let me welcome all of you to this panel discussion. And um, I would like to get started with our discussion now by asking everybody one first question so that you can give us a short input statement of about um, three to five minutes before we continue um, with a discussion of 20 minutes. And thereafter, we open the floor for questions. And I hope our audience will have some interesting ones for us. So let me start with um, Amro Ali. Amro, Liverpool winger and captain of the Egyptian national team, Mohamed Salah, is probably one of the most famous Arab athletes of all time. Being a national hero in Egypt, what role can football players like Mo Salah assume within society? Uh, thank you, Jan, and thank you, Jonas, uh, for organizing this very fascinating event. I'm really, it's a pleasure to be part of it. And also, uh, I just love that it's timely with the World Cup uh, coming up. Uh, Jan, basically to answer your question uh, that's in, in a bigger context, in the wider scope that uh, Muhammad Salah uh, arises amidst the global moral crisis in sports. And to give you an anecdote, so the comedian James Corden uh, captured this, this crisis back in 2010 when he addressed the British sport elites at the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Award. And he said, I don't see a room full of sporting legends here. I see a room full of people looking for their next sponsorship deal, book deal, TV series. You lot need to get back to basics. Remember who you are, what you are, what you stand for. And so this whole uh, notion of the, the sports figure being fully appropriated by global capitalism um, diminishes whatever ethical qualities we might associate with, with sports figures. Uh, also, I would say that um, another, and, and I'd like to connect this to something else that in 2016, when the boxer Muhammad Ali passed away, uh, the Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby of Louisville drew on African-American theological discourse to crystallize an athlete's quest for dignity. And, the, and he said that before James Brown said, I'm black and I'm proud, Ali said, I'm black and I'm pretty. Black and pretty were an oxymoron. Blacks did not say pretty, but Muhammad, but Muhammad Ali said, I'm proud, I'm pretty, I'm glad of who I am. And when he said that, he infused in African-Americans a sense of somebodiness. And it was actually Martin Luther King Jr. who initially coined the term somebodiness, that without a deep sense of somebodiness, a person would be incapable of rising to full, full maturity. So Muhammad Salah comes in these fractures. He comes uh, where there is a despondency across the Arab and Muslim world, and he touches on something that revives uh, that, that, that somebodyness. Um, and I'll end that point for now. I have more to say on it, but I don't want to take up on the other speakers. Yeah, could you maybe elaborate just very slightly to explain to us what do you mean by, by a sense of somebodyness and how important is this um, for individuals in, in a society? It's... Uh, when you are in a system uh, that uh, dehumanizes you, and this could be across any, it could be dictatorships, it could be liberal democracy under a heavy spell of neoliberalism, the idea is that somebodyness allows you to reassert your sense of agency, your sense of uh, connectivity to the world. And it, it's probably more pronounced amongst Arab and Muslims, just given the, the state of the, the Muslim world today. So when the Arab and Muslim athlete in the West projects an athletic artistry and cultural firepower, which is not unique to Muhammad Salah, we have seen this with uh, Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Mike Tyson and other, other Muslim athletes. Uh, 
she or he, they dis, they, what they do is that they dislocate the arrangements that make the current state of merciless racism possible. So there was a Stanford University study that highlighted that a, foot, a football star such as Muhammad Salah has caused Islamophobic hate crimes to drop by 18.9% um, and anti-Muslim tweets to fall by half in the Liverpool area. So what they say is positive exposure to our group role models can reveal new information that humanizes the our group at large. Someone like Salah opens up new conceptual pathways uh, to deal with Muslims and people of color and enable uh, a plurality uh, for those who might be intolerant to be exposed to something uh, uh, that's different, let's put it that way. And so um, the idea of somebodyness uh, really allows the, 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 the person who might be marginalized in society or looked at differently or discriminated uh, structurally uh, through structural forces of racism to assert a sense of somebodyness in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. That's the best to say. Yeah, thank you for this explanation. And I find remarkable that you included not this kind of nation state society perspective, but you showed us these importance of entanglements between um, the Arab world and also Europe when you talked about the um, decrease in, in hate crimes and negative tweets. Um, I would like to um, address a different topic right now and um, like to welcome Mahfoud Amara. So in my view, there are many historic and contemporary examples that provide evidence for the fact that football and politics are interconnected. Um, Dr. Amara, what are some key features of the relationship between football and politics in the Arab world in general and in the Gulf region in particular? And if I may add a second related question, how did football historically develop in different Arab countries? So take your time and maybe you can give us some examples. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the, you know, first of all, for the invitation. And uh, I'm really glad to be here with you. And uh, as you said, you know, your introduction, this is really uh, timely. Uh, we are going to have in in a few days, you know, the one of the, the most important events, mega sports events that is going to be staged by an Arab country. And I will see it more as, as um, you know, th this is more an outcome of a process, you know, that started, you know, uh, with uh, the colonial uh, era. But before I will go into the, that process, you know, with re in relation to your question about the relationship between politics and sports, I think in general, uh, I mean, the sport, you know, started with the big, you know, with the start, with the foundation of nation state system. So we cannot, you know, particularly in the modern era, so we cannot deassociate sports from the states and from the nation and the notion of statehood and nationhood. So, I mean, politics and sport were always, has all, I mean, have been always there and, um, and they have been uh, associated and one need the other. You know, you cannot have a sport without uh, the intervention of the state at different, you know, different levels in terms of funding, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, policies and laws and regulations. And equally, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the states now and nation states need sports to consolidate their, uh, their, uh, you know, their, their uh, existence, you know, uh, symbolically through participation in, uh, uh, you know, international sports events or through the hosting of international sports events, the, the rising of the flag, you know, during those uh, competitions. So in a way, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, you know the, the notion that we are surprised that politics is, uh, uh, is present in, 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 in sports. I mean, uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, accept that as, you know, as uh, something which is new, you know, it's been always there. And, uh, now, in terms of the, the Arab world, um, as I said, you know, we need to see the, the Qatar, you know, hosting the FIFA World Cup as a product and outcome of process, which started with the diffusion of modern sports in the region through colonialism or through other means, uh, for instance, trade and, uh, and uh, particularly in the Gulf region uh, uh, with, uh, you know, with you know, with the history, the, the, you know, with oil, you know, and the, the emergence of those national, you know, companies, you know, uh, particularly uh, foreign companies coming to the region, you know, to help in terms of the extraction of oil. So when they came, you know, they brought with them different, uh, you know, uh, cultural practices. One of the one of those one of those cultural practices, of course, 
uh, a sport. Uh, and there have been differences, of course, between North Africa and, and the Middle East, and particularly the Gulf region. But, you know, in, uh, in Algeria, or in particularly in, in the Maghreb, you know, North Africa, in a way, those sport practices have been imposed, you know, uh, with uh, direct colonialism, which is a military occupation. Um, so the first, uh, maybe the in the first stage, um, particularly in North Africa, um, colonial powers and administration were using sport as a means to differentiate between the you know uh, those who belong to the colonial administration and those who are external to the colonial administration, those who are you know the indigenous uh, populations which maybe at the beginning were not being perceived as maybe having the, the civilizational and then the, the cultural kind of, uh, um, um, how say, willingness or possibilities or capacities to be able to integrate, you know, modern sports. And, uh, you know, sport and modern sports came to somehow to um, justify the what we call the civilization mission of the of the colonialism in, in, in the region. And I think this is really important because this explains the relationship, the engagement of the region with, with sport, which is, you know, particularly in, you know, uh, when it's enforced by occupation, is being seen as something which is external. This was at the beginning. Then, of course, you know, the uh, sport, interestingly, it's, it's, it, uh, is in itself is very appealing. So many people, you know, the, the population, the indigenous population started to embrace this, you know, the culture and maybe even to use it for their own, uh, uh, their own uh, uh, means, you know, in terms of the foundation of the nationalist movements and uh, using sport as a means of resistance against the colonial uh, power. And we have seen in the Arab region, the, the, the foundation of, uh, those uh, national uh, sports clubs that they were using specifically, you know, a, a nationalist kind of symbols, you know, to differentiate their identity uh, um, from that of the colonial uh, power. And the sport was the kind of the beer of this kind of the foundation of those nationalist movements. Um, and then we moved, you know, after the independence, um, the independent nations in the Arab region, they uh, straightforward, they, uh, you know, they, you know, they accepted and they adhered to the international uh, sports system, and they found that, you know, they, they they saw the importance, the the growing importance and significance of sports in terms of consolidating their nation state uh, formation. So we have seen starting from the the fifties uh, with the independence of our Arab countries. Uh, uh, affiliating into international sports federations and, of course, international committee. Then they started participating in those uh, competitions. And with the 1960s, 70s, they even started, you know, getting interested in bidding for those continental and regional uh, games, the Afri uh, the Pan-African Games, the Pan-Arab Games that, that was they were established in the 50s, and, of course, the Mediterranean Games and the Arab uh, the Arabs they played an important role in the, even in the, the, the in the in terms of the, the development and the establishment of the Mediterranean Games, uh, with uh, Hassan Basha who was the the head of the National uh, um, Olympic Committee in Egypt who, who who had this idea of bringing all the Mediterranean countries you know together and they won the umbrella which is the Mediterranean Games, uh, in uh, and using the Mediterranean Games as a way to promote as well the Olympic movement. And from the 70s and the 80s, we've started seeing some countries in the Arab world even, you know, being interested in bidding for mega sports events. And particularly in the 80s with Morocco, it's con consecutive kind of uh, attempts and bids, you know, to hosting the FIFA World Cup and uh, uh, as well as Egypt. Um, with in, in parallel to that, there was uh, also strategy to develop elite sport uh, systems in those countries and improving the ranking of Arab countries in international sport competitions, particularly in the Olympics, and qualification to major international uh, tournaments. Of course, the FIFA World Cup, you know, becoming one of the, the most uh, you know prestigious ones. Uh, so we have seen countries from the Arab region qualif qualifying to the, the Arab Cup. Uh, to, sorry, to the uh, FIFA World Cup until uh, if maybe we can jump to 20, you know, uh, to, uh, 2010, 11, when Qatar, you know, bit 
uh, for before that they bid it for the the Olympic Games and they were not successful and then they went for the FIFA World Cup because it was kind of um, like a, a natural kind of progression in terms of their the strategy of Qatar but also mainly also and I'm going to say other countries in the region in GCC with regards to using sport for their international strategy. Uh, in terms of uh, branding uh, their country's investment using sports as a means to invest in the uh, global market. Uh, also, in relation to, uh, you know, the uh, funding, maybe other uh, source of revenues for the countries and moving away from uh, uh, depending only from oil and gas as, as a source of revenue. So we had, you know, uh, Qatar, first they had the 26, uh, tw sorry, 2006 Asian Games, I think that was a key moment, a milestone. So, and then they went for a bigger, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition. First bidding for the Olympic Games, they were not successful, and then they were successful with uh, the FIFA uh, World Cup. So, Dimitri, I think would, um, yes. Very sorry, I would kindly like to ask you to stop right here because we will get to the World Cup um, in a second. But I would like to bring to the discussion now um, Hiba El Jafil. So um, a practitioner's view, um, you could also say. And I would like to ask you, Hiba, um, as the head coach of the Lebanese team um, under 17, um, when you won the U17 Arab Women's Cup, which was um, taking place in Qatar, by the way, um, so somebody who contributed to the biggest success in Lebanese football, how would you assess the impact of such an achievement um, to society? She might have some connection problems. Let's maybe wait a few seconds. Yeah, so, uh, hi, Jan. We can't hear you, Hiba. Okay, so I hope that your connection will be better in a second, but I guess... Um, in order to keep things going, I will move on to um, Özgür. I hope you are with us. Um, to a different topic. And that means I, I want to bring in um, on the German perspective, basically. So basically, um, when you look at the composition of the German national team, as it is now and as it was about two decades ago, something has fundamentally changed. So I, I looked it up. I think the very first person with some kind of a migratory background was Maurizio Gaudino, born in Germany, but with Italian parents. Um, and now we have a much more diverse team. But this basically only started with the World Cup in 2006, basically. Before that, it was somebody like Oliver Neuville from Switzerland, for instance, and Miroslav Klose, who was born in Poland. Um, so my question would be, when it comes to a growing number of players with a migrant biography, to what extent are diverse national football teams challenging established narratives of national belonging, Özgür? <clears throat> thanks so much for the question, uh, Jan, and thanks for, so much for the invitation. Before I start, just a technical question, uh, because I see that Hiba is back. Would you like to continue with her as long I, as- I think we, we can continue with you and then um, I will bring in Hiba. Great. So <clears throat> um, to your question and your observation, it's yes and no, because um, my colleague Stefan Metzka um, has shown that there have been migrants in the German football national team already almost 100 years ago with, with, with Polish background uh, uh, individuals playing in the German football national team or for the German uh, football national team. So, of course, it's different in the 90s because uh, of the renationalization tendencies and with, with like forgetting that we have been 
uh, we have had a, a multi-ethnic football national team, but the multi was not so great. It was just a couple of uh, ethnic backgrounds, which changed dramatically in the past 20 years. That's right. We further did have uh, um, debates over Paulo Ring in the 90s, as far as I remember, because he was uh, Brazilian backgrounded. And then, of course, we had the first uh, black, uh, um, like, you know, Gerard Azamoa was a big thing. But of course, we did also have uh, discussions over Jimmy Hartwig to play for the German football national team. So we had some individual cases, but we didn't have uh, a group of Muslim backgrounded uh, individuals playing for the German football national team. And that, of course, has caused intense debates in the past 10 to 15 years. So it was a big thing when Mesut Özil had his handshake with Angela Merkel after a match against Turkey, against his ethnic roots, quote unquote, uh, which was played in Berlin. And then he scored against Turkey. He was booed by Turkish fans, Turkish immigrant fans, uh, during the match, and then he scored the, the winning goal for Germany. And after that match, it was the first time in German politics that a chancellor shaked hands uh, with a football player. But that's not the point. The point was that it was the first time that this image was circulated publicly, was politicized, right? So it is not a big thing that the chancellor goes... Uh, handshaking with the uh, uh, football stars. But it is a big thing if this is politicized. And it was politicized by her party, uh, uh, which which uh, circulated, which, which, you know, sent this image uh, or which allowed the publication of this image in, in, in the public media. And that was a big thing because this was a Turkish immigrant, Muslim immigrant, uh, son who played for Germany and scored against the country of his ethnic roots. That was a big thing. And then uh, Mr. Uzi received the, the, the um, integration prize in Germany, the Bambi uh, um, for integration. So that was promoted as a big story. And that was accompanied, of course, with like other, with, with Jerome Boateng, black, uh, 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 black football, national team player, Sami Kadura, who was not that present, but still who was another uh, Muslim member of the German football national team. So we saw that the Middle East as a region entered the German football national team, and that caused uh, uh, debates because the political landscape itself has, ha has had changed as well. Uh, we had the debates um, um, triggered by uh, Zaratzin back then, right? It was against Muslims, it was against Turks uh, uh, that they wouldn't integrate into Germany, that they, you know, you know, you, you may know these uh, discourses raised by Tilo Zaratzin. So their integration into the football national team was a big thing. And we have had a decade of intense debates, which, uh, unfortunately, ended with Mesut Özil leaving the uh, uh, German football national team in 2018 and accusing um, not the team members, but he observed structures of racism, uh, which he um, articulated, and then the thing was done with him. But we do have Ikai Gundogan still in the football national team. And I think that those, these debates were productive in the sense that we had to discuss it. And, and, and now we are moving towards an era where the ethnic background, the ancestry, so to say, is not that relevant anymore, especially if you see the current football national team. We see that um, it is way more diverse than it has been. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Özgür. And I would like to get back to the um, issue of Gunduan and um, Özil um, in a minute. But now um, let me ask you again, Hiba. Um, it was a big success when um, your team won the Arab Cup in um, Qatar back then. 
Um, so the question goes also beyond this success, because I would like to know um, how would you assess the impact of such achievements on a society, maybe also in particular on Lebanese society, which is suffering many crises all at once? Yeah, so hi, Jan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this great invitation uh, and uh, for the uh, good introduction. So, yeah, as you mentioned that, uh, like in 2015, after having the, the Arab Cup for the under-17 national team, as a one of the, like it was the first achievement in Lebanon, um, uh, also as a female, first female that coached a national team in Lebanon, um, as before, like there was a big like block, if we can say, Uh, on me, uh, like from the men coaches, while, while I'm doing the AFC, A and B and C licenses. So they were like, why a female coach is coaching a national team? So after going to, to Qatar and having this achievement when coming back again to Lebanon, like all the male coaches that they were with me in the coaching coach, uh, courses, They were like, they were clapping. They were very happy for the achievement that we did. Uh, that this, after, after this achievement, uh, we come back to Lebanon, then everyone, every social media, everyone on the television were like, we're, we're talking about this achievement. And after that, uh, you know, when, when everything is on the news or on the social media, then, uh, then everyone, every parents, should like encourage or will encourage their parents, their, their female uh, or their daughters to be part of the maybe clubs, maybe national team. And either the schools also, they started like working more in the schools for the female, uh, female football, uh, especially in the, like in the public schools and private schools more. So this comes like, For me, that was like the beginning of the female football in Lebanon. Like because before when I was a player, no one was uh, interested in playing football. No one was interested of like taking in news on what we are doing as a national team since 2000, like 2005, 2006. We were in Egypt in 2005 as a national team and we played versus Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, and we were like losing 10-0, 12-0 as a national team. After that, in the, in the Arab Cup, the under-17 won, uh, won against Algeria 1-0. So did you see like the difference, how we, like, we, we changed the mentality of women football in Lebanon? So this for me, this was like a great achievement since that time, since 2015, we, or, like, we, we, we like get rid of everything uh, bad everything bad every bad things in lebanon when they put in their minds that women football is nothing in lebanon and after that when we won like everyone in lebanon males before females are saying that women's football is very is very good in lebanon we need to support them and we need to help them in order to achieve more and more thank you Hiba, and um, please allow me a follow-up question Do you think um, the World Cup in Qatar will um, have an impact or can have an impact also on um, women's football in the Arab world as a whole? Or do you not see such a no, reason? I, I don't think so, because it differs. You know, like the federations, most of the, like we, can, like, we can say Gulf federations, because the Gulf federations are not working directly to the national teams. They are working through committees. You know, like in Saudi Arabia, if you see now, Saudi Arabia is one of the big, of the like best national teams in, in, in the Gulf area. Also maybe in the, in the Middle East, because they are working a lot on female football. They, they like, they are having a, like one of the best coaches, Monica Staub from Germany. Uh, they are working futsal and football. They are having like um, uh, the, 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 like two leagues, League A, League B, and the Futsal League, they are having like a national, very good national team working, having uh, like uh, 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 camps outside uh, Saudi Arabia. So federations are not working directly 
through the clubs or the national teams, I'm, I'm talking to in the, in the Gulf area, they are working through committees. So I don't think so it affects the women's, the women's football. Um, maybe it affects the men's football, not the women's football. Okay, thank you, Hiba. I'd like to stay with the topic of the World Cup and um, get back to Mahfoud Amara again. So um, I would like to know what is your opinion? Um, what meaning does um, the World Cup have for Qatar on the one hand and for the Arab world um, on the other? What, what would you say? I think for for Qatar, as I, as I explained before, this is a, a you know kind of a natural progress. You know, for them, Qatar has been uh, before the pandemic uh, been organizing uh, around 50 uh, you know uh, regional and international events on a yearly basis, and they are already they position themselves as a a key player when it comes to organizing different uh, types of sports. Uh, so they had uh, also the, the 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 handball world championship. They had the the you know the athletics world championship, and uh, of course the FIFA World Cup. Next is going to be the Asian uh, Cup 2023, and then the Asian Games 2030, uh, and maybe the maybe the next with the next uh, you know uh, kind of target will be to host, you know, the Olympics, you know, uh, maybe with other, uh, jointly with other countries in, in, in the region, Saudi Arabia, they already got the, the rights, you know, for the 2032 uh, Asian Games and uh, as well as the winter um, uh, games as well. So, I mean, there are more players uh, who are from in the region that are now uh, present and visible the, the international within the international uh, sports system. They have the ambition you know, to, uh, you know, uh, to prove that they have that capability, you know, to host uh, those uh, events and the capacity. And uh, even now, you know, for Qatar, the, you know, the, the, even the, the possibility to, to transfer knowledge to other countries in the region, within the region, and maybe uh, with similar economies and uh, maybe similar uh, kind of uh, uh, logistical kind of, uh, or similar territory, to how to, to deal with, um, you know, those kind of uh, events. This is very important for Qatar because it's pushed for a number of uh, development projects with regards to uh, infrastructures, uh, transportation, uh, with regards to changing lifestyle as well. You know, there have been a number of issues around, you know, lack of uh, physical activity. So now there are a number of programs that are promoting physical activity. And, you know, the, the host, you know, the, the organization the organization that is, or, you know, hosting and planning for the FIFA World Cup is, is also called, is called, you know, Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy. So they are not thinking of, about the FIFA World Cup as the, the kind of the, the end of, you know, their strategy, but the beginning of their strategy. So for Qatar as a nation, uh, it, it's very important. It gives, you know, it's boosts, boosting its, its confidence. So the idea that uh, being a small country with a small territory doesn't matter, right? I mean, what you, you know is more about what you can prove to the rest of the world that uh, you have the, the knowledge and the capacity and uh, you know the the mobile, you know, you have the you know the mobilization that you need, you know, from all the sectors together coming together, you know, uh, to. Um, work toward the success uh, of these events and then uh, future events for the region for the arab region yeah as you know the qataris were when they were bidding for the fifa world cup they emphasized that this is not only for qatar but for the whole region this is important in terms of changing a little bit the stereotype of the region for people to know a little bit more about the other you know uh, aspects of the region that are not necessarily you know related to security or uh, or war, or terrorism, or other you know aspects, you know, so to show about you know uh, to the rest of the the you know of the, the words, you know, the hospitality of the Arab world, uh, it's you know uh, it's welcoming culture. There are a number of uh, aspects around the football uh, World Cup. So yeah, football is a football competition, but around that there are a number of you know opportunities for cultural exchange, for uh, dialogue, for debates, for an opportunity to meet the other, the both sides, you know, the other being the visitors who are coming here to Qatar with uh, their different background, different cultural norms, and they want to be in Qatar to celebrate, you know, the football. But is, I think it's uh, likewise from the other side, you know, from those visitors who are coming to Qatar to know a little bit more 
about the Qatari, not necessarily from the media, but uh, you know, uh, to know them as you know from inside. And I think this is very uh, up, you know, important opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mahfoud. Amro, one question to you. Um, the Egyptian national team lost this year's Africa Cup final to Senegal. And less than two months later, they also lost the decisive match for the World Cup qualifier again against Senegal. My question would be, how did um, Egyptian society discuss these defeats? Um, did they matter in public debates or were they rather irrelevant in the face of the challenges of everyday life? Uh, actually, I, I think uh, football for Egyptians, like it is for many uh, people around the world, is, is like the bread and circus for the masses. It, it's a sedative and it allows people to forget uh, the, the pressing economic problems. So uh, when the, the matches were taking place, the coffee houses around uh, Alexandria, you know, from Alexandria to Aswan were, were full. Uh, and, and people were glued in and hoping that this would be some sort of redemption for, you know, for, for, their, for their ills. Uh, and so when uh, the defeat happened, um, I could remember the one with Senegal, uh, that, uh, that people were, they didn't protest or they didn't, uh, because this has happened in past matches where they were defeated, they might get very aggressive in the streets, etc. But there wasn't... Uh, There wasn't any of that. It was almost like the exit out of the coffee houses was, uh, you know, the key social spaces of the Arab world, the coffee house, the Awa. You could say it was a very melancholic um, exit from these spaces. And it was an unusual scene uh, for me compared to other uh, sorts of um, entering a football match, to watch a football match and exiting. Uh, but overall, I would say they they just accepted it. Um, there wasn't, uh, you know, that sort of a 2009 denial with the match with Algeria and, and all that and, and the craziness that we saw. Um, there's none of that. Um, it was very, very low-key, extreme disappointment. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, the what widespread depression does that as well in a society that it doesn't allow you to sort of, okay, react any further than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Özgür, back to you. So um, you might remember everybody that the German national team performed very poorly in 2018 in the World Cup. And in the aftermath, there were claims in the public debate that one reason for this poor performance was um, the destruction of the national team by the discussion ensuing a photograph that Mesut Özil and Ilkay Gündoğan had taken together with Turkish President Erdogan only a month before the start of the tournament. What is your take on this controversy and what does it tell us about the attitude of German society towards players with a migratory background? <clears throat> Yes, uh, thanks so much for this question, uh, Jan. Um, it, it seems to be the $1 million dollar question, and I'm here to uh, reply to that or offer a solution for that. Um, so the point is um, that this uh, image of them became a public thing, right? And it is interesting that it happened in that year because there have been similar images in the years before annually emerging in the public space, but they weren't a thing. And that sort of shows uh, what we have uh, showed in our um, research article with my colleague Stefan Metzger, that international football events open up windows of opportunity for politicizing international football or the intersection of international football and politics. So it is international events, international football events that open those windows of opportunity. It happens in the, like ahead of the events, there is this, you know, public uh, attention. So as today, we start having these rooms of uh, negotiation and deliberation because in two weeks we will have the World Cup, right? And these events happen all over the world because the event is approaching. Then during the event, there are like things happening and then we have to discuss more. And then after the event, we evaluate the event 
So this is, seems to be a cycle that happens across time and space, which ties politics to international football. And this is very interesting because even with the simple chronology of that image, that the image emerged in every year, but has not been politicized until it was uh, 2018 and the World Cup in, in Russia. So that's very interesting to observe. Um, and of course, it is interesting to see what happened after that. It is interesting how uh, to see how that um, had or did not have an impact on the German football national team, on the performance of the German football national team. And it was also interesting to see that a picture with the German president after that was not like taking too much into consideration. And that accompanies or that supports our claim that we are still not thus far to understand that people can have multiple belongings without being part of a zero-sum game. Our contemporary understanding still is if you are more A, then you have to be less of B. You cannot be both fully 100% both. That doesn't work. And that's our contemporary understanding, especially in the case of um, two identities, which are said to be incompatible, right? There is a whole discourse in Germany about Islam and, and Muslims belonging to Germany or not belonging to Germany. And if that comes together, a Muslim Turkish identity and a German identity, then it has to be a zero sum, zero sum game in the public opinion. Yeah. And this is something we have, we are in the process of, you know, uh, talking around and trying to debate and find better solutions to that. I think that's an important observation, which is certainly also true for um, other countries. But um, instead of continuing with this topic, I think we should open the floor for questions and answers because we've already run quite far in terms of time. And the first question came from um, Lassine El Yusufi. Um, it was not directed to um, somebody in particular, but the question could be summed up um, when it comes to the relationship between football and politics. How can football um, contribute to um, certain lessons to humanity, like values, living together, um, teamwork? Um, what would you say? Who would like to an answer um, this question? What can football bring to to such a such a question. You can see it, I think, also in the QA um, box. Amro, would you um, give it a try? Sure, sure. If I was check out the question again. Uh, okay, so okay, yeah, humanity values. Okay. Uh, I I don't think it's the, the football alone. It helps, of course, significantly if the football player and there's a successful player and a success, successful team. But it's actually often what happens off the field that gets connected back into that. And to give you one, one example, so in 2017, uh, when, when uh, Egypt defeated Congo, um, that was celebrated. But, um, but in Mohamed Salah was instrumental in that success, but still he didn't rise to the stardom that he did. And what happened was that when um, a millionaire in Egypt offered, offered him a villa, a luxury villa, uh, for free. Uh, he refused it. And he said to give it, to donate it, the money of that villa, to uh, his village. And, and so this was something very surreal. Uh, it punctured something and, and it, uh, uh, you know, it awakened something because it, it's usually part of the wheeling and dealing of um, you know, giving football players cars and, and, and villas and, and whatnot. And he focused, he asked that money to be sent to uh, the building of a hospital or, uh, or the education system um, in, in, in his village of Nagrid. So in a way, the, these acts of the field, uh, and remember they were not choreographed, they were like accidental and then they just got picked up. Um, they, they have an assertion of human values within a dehumanizing system. So the, his, 
Salah's rejection of the villa pierced a culture that celebrates material wealth, consumer culture, and individual advancement. So, and I don't want to make it sound like uh, Salah is not part of some, you know, the, the, the global capitalist um, endeavor because he does appear in Vodafone and Uber commercials and other lucrative contracts, but he does make football meaningful in a deeper way and a, and, and a wider way. Um, so I, I think when we consider that when a football player can appear, for example, in an in a anti-drug commercial and the hotlines shoot up 400% in Egypt as a result of his appearance and saying, don't do drugs, uh, that's really saying something about how he makes use of his football success uh, for the social good. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Amru. Ezgu, do you want to add something to this question? Yes, uh, certainly. What I would like to add is that it's very important to have a sociological view on that because football is not only elite football, right? Actually, <clears throat> it is much, much more people uh, creating this culture on a daily basis without being seen for that in all the clubs they are in the in the football associations people who do voluntary work on the in the clubs in the associations on a very local level it is actually them who create the culture of football which doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't care about these highly public football figures of course we should because it is them who hopefully will break with established and traditional understandings of certain things, in my case, of nationalism, because they bring in, you know, the case of Nuri Shahin, of Ikai Gundogan, of, of Mesut Özil, they bring in, bring in a transnational perspective on Turkish-German belonging in Turkey and in, Tur in Germany. That's huge. However, the, the lived part of it is much more important. You know, it is the people who do voluntary work. It is all of the people, men, women, trans people, LGBTIQ people who play soccer, who play football and who create a culture around that on a very daily basis. I think that's very important to, 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 to take into consideration. And, and, and I hope it sort of speaks also to the other question by Mohammed Al Saidi, because um, I would say that it's yes, it's it's the public figures who break those things, but it is the it is on a daily basis of people playing football and creating a culture around it on a very daily basis, which is even more important. If I may just add one sentence to the question from Mohammed Asaidi, I think football can be both. It can be um, a tool for progress, but also um, it can be used in a reactionary way, and sometimes it is really hard to. Um, situated and um, those of you who follow the debate um, I I just noted that um, a while ago Mohammed Abu Treka the other big player from um, Egypt um, was accused of um, homophobia um, while speaking on public broadcasts so you you have these um, examples as well but certainly um, it can also help for female um, empowerment don't you think Hiba so football as a tool for empowerment do you see this potential or do you rather think that it, it's um, a reactionary force that prevents um, participation yeah so as you know like I have my own NGO Unity for so it's like I name it Unity for Change because we like we need to unite together facing all these problems in order to have to change the, the, the whole world, to change the whole mentalities. So for me, like we, we're working on sports for development. It's not about only football. We're working how to include education through sports, through football, how to include gender equality through football, how to include social vision through football. Iraqi so we try to to combine them together to play in one team in order to uh, to like um, get rid of the of the problems that that the big big politics are facing so the young children like listen what's going on through like different countries and then they can like take this through their lives 
So we collect them together and then we try to work with them uh, 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 for these titles like women empowerment, like social cohesion, as like gender equality, and it was it will be like through football. Um, thank you, Hiba. Um, in the meantime, uh, Mafut, you had already answered um, one question in a, in a written way, and I'm afraid that we have already run out of time. So I would like to ask um, the four of you um, to um, do a very quick round um, and tell me what do you think who will um, be the winner of the World Cup um, 2022? Um, Mafut, what, what, what is your guess? I think the winner is already Qatar because he's going to organize is going to organize these mega sports events despite all the challenges, despite all the you know the maybe the the criticism and uh, and maybe the, the the conditions that happens with the with the blockade and everything. So they are you know uh, they promised that they were going to organize it and they are here you know ready. The stadiums are ready. So I think uh, you know uh, I would say. Qatar has already uh, won, uh, and not with Qatar is the whole uh, region. Yeah, so let's see how they will perform on the pitch. Ezgu, what do you think? Who will be the winner? Well, that's a tough one, I have to say. <clears throat> can't be Turkey. <laughs> yeah, it can't be Turkey. That's um, you know, that's impossible. Um, it's it's a tough it's a tough one because this event is a political event. I I, I understand it as a political event. So whatever I'll say, there will be a political dimension to it. Uh, that's why I, I, I'd like to abstain from that question. And I would like to say something on the reactionary moment you just mentioned. It is, of course, not beneficial if a person like Cristiano Ronaldo has a picture with Jordan Peterson, because mm -hmm. that fosters these reactionary moments. And it's, of course, not uh, uh, um, normatively good for us that the last And this uh, World Cup will be in countries that um, have a very specific way of understanding LGBTIQ politics, right? So in that sense, my guess would be Germany, just because I live in Germany. Okay, Amro, if somebody gave you $1,000, on whom would you bet as a world champion? Uh, that, one, that question is quite easy. I think... Uh... The, the champion who, um, who will win the World Cup, it's, it's obviously Agia. I mean, <laughs> we have fortunately benefited from this uh, event and we brought great minds together. And I've learned a lot. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there is no better champion and uh, success than Agia itself. So I'm convinced it's going to be Agia. <laughs> That would already be a very nice closing remark, but um, I would like to hear from Hiba. Who do you think will be world champion? Yes. So I, I think I um, I don't hear you properly. Yeah. I don't know if everybody else experiences the same. Would you like to repeat it? So now it's better? Slightly. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I was saying that I would love to have like one of the Arab countries holding the World Cup, but it's shame from me if I don't support Germany because I already I already have like uh, know their philosophy and I already did the coaching courses in Germany and the internships there, so I support Germany. Uh, like to win the World Cup, for sure. Many Germans love to hear this, I guess. And in 2014, when Germany became world champion, it was Algeria that brought Germany um, to the brink of, of a defeat. Um, this won't be possible this time because also this big um, sporting nation um, did not qualify, unfortunately. But let's see how, for instance, Tunisia will perform. And I would like to thank the panelists for their very, very interesting and lively contributions and um, also for the um, attention from the audience and um, thanks for Agia for hosting this. Um, I learned a lot and I found it very interesting. So thank you very much to all.